Father, thank you for this amazing opportunity. You're such a good, good father. And that is just who you are. And I pray, Lord, that we could bask in that reality today, that we could understand deeply what that means in our lives. You desire so much more than the practice of religion for us, but a living and loving relationship with you that makes a real difference in our lives. So thank you that we get to be here to worship you in this spirit. And I pray now that we, as we look at your word, that you would speak to us, draw us close to you, God. Allow us, Father, to feel your presence in our lives that we might be changed from within and go from this place being different people. I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth, I pray that the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you have a Bible, you can turn in it to the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we are. And today I want to talk to you about this idea of suffering as a gift. You know, we have an amazing diversity in the room. We have those who are early birds. Any early birds? Get up early. You like to get up early, right? Early birds, night owls, right? Yeah, night owls, partiers, that kind of thing. Uh, we, we have coffee people, right? Coffee drinkers, and we have tea sippers, you know? And I don't mean the ones from UT I'm talking about. <laughs> right, there you go. Um, we have dog people and we have cat people. You guys know the difference between a dog and a cat, right? So a dog looks at its owner and says, these people feed me, love me, take care of me. They must be God. A cat looks at its owner and said, these people love me, take care of me, feed me. I must be God. (laughs) And that's kind of the attitude these cats have most of the time. Um, there are young people in the room. There are older people. There are people who came out of a non-religious background growing up. That's just like me, never really attended church. And then there are others of you who are here who had a drug problem when you were younger. You were drugged to church each and every Sunday, every time the door was open. So we have this amazing diversity in our church. But here's one thing that is true and common among all of us. We all have an experience with pain and suffering. We all do. And it has a way of affecting us deeply. And what we've been discovering through this series is that God's presence is found right there in the middle of that pain and suffering. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture today that illustrates this so well. We're going to meet a man named the Apostle Paul, and he is describing his experience in his life. He's describing the deepest pain of his life, I believe. And it's intensely personal, and it's somewhat emotional, And it's authentic. And by the way, don't you just love the scripture presents these people in such authentic ways? It's evidence of the fact that man did not write this book (laughs) because men would not tell such things about themselves. They would not be this honest about their failures and their weaknesses. And yet, time and again, we see this in the scripture. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look in verses 7 through 10. Here's what Paul says. So, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of all my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, we're going to look at three portions of this scripture today. First of all, what we want to do is zero in on the suffering of Paul, the exact suffering of the Apostle Paul. What was he going through after all? I mean, what is he describing here? He, be, he, he says at the beginning of this passage in verse 7, he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. You go, what's he talking about there? Well, you have to read earlier in the chapter to really understand what the Apostle Paul is describing. You know that the Apostle Paul gained great prominence in Christianity. He was He was Christianity's most influential figure, I would say so, even up to today. The Apostle Paul planted several churches. He wrote almost half of the entire New Testament. 
And at the beginning here of chapter 12, he describes a vision that he has, a revelation as he describes it, where 14 years ago, he says, I was caught up into the third heaven, and I heard things that cannot be told, things which man cannot utter. Now, he gives no more details about it. All we know is that he had this amazing vision before God, and he saw things and heard things that were so great that he felt he did not have permission to share. Maybe he couldn't even describe. Now, add all these things up, okay? And you can understand why Paul would mention twice to keep me from becoming conceited, to keep me from becoming conceited. I mean, these things, all these things together, could give reason for the Apostle Paul to have pride. It's what we all struggle with. And because of the potential for that pride... He says he was experiencing suffering to keep him from it. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But he lists different forms of his suffering. And I want us to look at those. Toward the end of the passage, he lists all these different forms of his particular suffering. What were they? First of all, weaknesses. Weaknesses. Now, this is a feeling that we all have at one time or another where we feel inadequate. We feel like we don't measure up. We feel like we don't have the strength. We don't have the abilities. We don't have the intellect. That is necessary for certain things in our life, and we feel weak, we feel inadequate, we feel insecure. Next. He said, I experienced insults. This is where people devise clever ways to make us feel dumb, or to make us feel insignificant or irrelevant in some way. Insults from others to us. Paul had it. Hardships. Now, hardships have to go with an ongoing burden that someone is having to carry. It's an ongoing thing where each and every day there's a hardship that is faced. And Paul said, I face these hardships. These are things that come from the outside in. Next, he talked about persecutions. Now, persecutions are more than insults. Persecutions are judgments against us, biases, prejudices against us, consequences toward us that are a result of what? Our faith in Christ. They come for that particular reason. And Paul faced many persecutions, and then he mentions calamities. Now, natural disasters could really fall into this category. This just means trouble, things that go wrong, where we wish they went right. The Apostle Paul experienced all these kinds of things. I mean, look at this list. This pretty much covers everything, doesn't it? This is kind of a 360 view of suffering. And you go, okay, well, what exactly happened I mean, if you're like me, I'm interested in the details. What, what are the details with respect to these? Well, all you have to do is go back one chapter earlier to chapter 11. And you begin reading in verses 24 through 28, you're going to see the specific sufferings of Paul that really form these categories that he just listed. Here's what he says. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Now, if you're not familiar with that phrase, 40 lashes less one, this was a common phrase in the first century because the Jews would take people whom they were punishing and they would beat them. They would whip them. They would give them 40 lashes. 40 lashes would mean death. But instead of giving them 40, they would give them 40 less one, 40 minus one. But they wouldn't say 39, They would say 40 less one. Why? Because what they're wanting to illustrate is the fact that they would take people by these beatings to the point of death, minus one. And so Paul experienced five times this form of beating and whipping that would take him to the brink of death. Three times, he says, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Now, he's not talking about an extreme night at the rock concert, okay? He's talking about literally being pummeled with rocks, with stones, to try to kill him. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people. He goes on, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And I was complaining yesterday about having to reset my cable TV receiver. (laughs) 
he's not complaining here, by the way. If you read this whole thing in context, he's talking about how these sufferings have let, has led him closer to Christ. And then this last phrase here, and apart from the other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. He gave birth to all these churches. And he says, the greatest burden I bear is my burden, my anxiety for the health and the welfare of these churches. And you almost have to be a pastor to really understand that. For those of you who love your church and who feel a burden for this place, catch a glimpse of what the Apostle Paul would say when he feels a burden for these churches. These are the sufferings. So this is his experience. Now get this, please. Possibly the greatest man of God the world has ever known experienced immense suffering. Now, what does that do to the notion that the more godly you are, the less suffering you will experience? It throws it out the window, doesn't it? The more blessing of God upon your life, the less pain you're going to have. Or could it be that part of God's blessing is the pain that he gives? Could it be that suffering is a gift? Would Paul be as blessed and as used and as close to God as he was without the pain as he was with it? I think he would say, no, I could not be as blessed or as used or as close to God without the pain as I am with it. I read this week a story of a man from South Carolina who was paralyzed from the neck down. And the article reads like this, a Lawrence, that is Lawrence, South Carolina, a Lawrence man who is now paralyzed from the neck says he wouldn't change a thing. A single car crash left Gabriel Anderson paralyzed from the neck down, which followed many years of struggle. Anderson grew up with a mother addicted to cocaine. He had to steal so he and his younger sister could eat which led him down a dangerous path of drugs and violence. By age 18, Anderson was serving a nine-year prison sentence for drugs, possession of a firearm, and assault and battery. He was released after five years, but just two months later, he was back in confinement, this time in a hospital room. The car started spinning around, hit a tree, the seat snapped, and my neck just snapped, said Anderson. It took years for him to accept his new reality. He said he felt imprisoned in his body, a body that no longer moved as it once did, no, a body that no longer responded to his commands. I wanted to die, said Anderson. I didn't want to live. I couldn't take it. He said it was God entering his life that gave him the will to live. Almost 15 years now, after the accident, Anderson is making a name for himself in the local gospel music industry as a producer and a rapper. Surprising to some, Anderson calls the accident that left him in need of constant care a blessing. I would rather be like this and know God than to be walking and not know God. Because I didn't know God when... I was walking. Suffering is a gift. So this is the the suffering of Paul. Let's look now at the source of that suffering. Where did it come from? This is really contained here in this passage. What is the source of his suffering? He went on to say in verse 7 that a thorn in the flesh was given to him, a messenger of Satan, to harass him. Okay, so this thorn in the flesh, we don't know what it was. He doesn't tell us in detail what it is, but one of the things I think we can be sure of is that it falls into one of the categories that he listed for us. It was in there someplace. And where did it come from? Paul would give us a glimpse of that. Paul calls it a messenger of Satan was given to him, given to harass him. So one clear answer that we get from this passage is that some weaknesses and some suffering comes our way from Satan the author of evil. Satan seeks to afflict harm upon God's children through his messengers, as Paul would say, through his angels. And his aim is destruction. His aim is death. His aim is misery for us. But if we read deeply in this passage, it's not that simple. There's something more that's going on here. 
Satan is not the only one at work here in Paul's life. God is at work. This is not just the work of Satan to destroy. This is the work of God to save the Apostle Paul in some way. There are two reasons that we know this to be true. First of all, because Paul describes the purpose of the thorn was to prevent pride. He said it twice again, to keep me from becoming conceited. But Satan's whole purpose, his whole design is to produce pride, not prevent pride. So we know that ultimately it's not coming from the enemy, the evil one, Satan. Secondly, Paul prays in this verse, in verse 8, he prays that God would take the thorn away. That's who he turns to. And the Lord says, no, why? Because my power is going to be made perfect in this weakness. In other words, here's what's going on. God is saying to Paul, I have a purpose in what is happening to you. And I need you to see that. This is not ultimately Satan's destroying work. It is ultimately my saving and my sanctifying work in you. And God uses, as God can do, God uses the hostile intentions of Satan for Paul's holiness. And I want to say that he always can do that. If we will turn to him in our suffering. No matter the source, God can always do that. And so God left it with him, didn't he? Paul pleaded three times for God to take it away. No, my grace is going to be sufficient. It would not go away. This is something that Paul faced daily in his life. And I thought about that fact. I thought about people every day getting up with some thorn in the flesh. And there are people that are like that probably in this room. Every day, just to get out of bed is tough. Daily, this reminder of your weakness. You know, I thought this week, looking at the Apostle Paul, I thought about the Apostle Peter. You remember Peter's story. Peter denied Christ three times there before his crucifixion during Jesus' trials. And Jesus said to him, Peter, listen, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And that's exactly what happened. Peter denied Christ three times and the rooster crowed. And then after the resurrection, of course, we know that Peter was restored, that Peter was forgiven, and Peter was called to be a great man of God, a great missionary. But I've often thought about Peter every morning. I wonder if Peter, you know, we talked about early bird. I wonder if Peter was an early bird because every morning Peter woke up and he heard the rooster crow. I wonder what it reminded him of. Why Jesus would choose the rooster crowing for Peter. Because maybe Peter needed the daily reminder of his weakness, but also God's grace. God's ability to to restore every day, walking with that. What an amazing gift it was. So these are the sufferings of the Apostle Paul. But let's turn now, finally, let's turn to talk about what the gift was. What was the purpose of these sufferings? Now, the gift of suffering, I think, comes in different forms. There's a lot that we could describe today, but when we look particularly at this passage We would have to say that the gift of suffering, as Paul had asked, hey, please let this leave from me. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is going to be made perfect in your weakness. I think here's what the gift comprised. That God uses suffering in our life, first of all, to reveal our spiritual condition. For us to analyze, analyze how's our faith? And do we have faith? Folks, listen, you know this to be true. When you strip away the blessings, when you strip away the comfort, you're going to find out what a person's faith is really based upon. You're going to find out what their level of faith is. And are they trusting God only when he provides everything that they want? Or is their faith run deeper than that? So the gift of suffering means that God uses it to reveal our spiritual condition. Next, We learn from this passage that the gift of suffering includes God's ability to humble us, to make us humble. 
Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said, you have two choices. You can either be humble or be humbled. If you're in Christ, it's something that God expects, that you be humble. The Bible tells us that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, we don't really understand this fully as Christians, but this is so important. That humility, that humbling, that God's humbling process of us often accompanies blessing. Look how, look how God was using the Apostle Paul in these amazing ways. And yet, coinciding with God's use of the Apostle Paul and all the great things that he was doing, God was also in a process of constantly humbling the Apostle Paul through this thorn in the flesh. And it says something to me. While we're praying for blessing, we need to realize that the more we are blessed by God, the more we seek for God to use us, the more likely we will need to be what? Humbled by God. Which means be careful what you pray for. Because often accompanying accompanying those prayer requests is the need for our pride to be taken away. On the backside of all that blessing that we're pleading for may be pain. So that God can actually use us, that we can be prepared to steward what he actually blesses us with. We pray for blessing, pray to be used, but be prepared also in response to that prayer, to receive humbling. And here's the final form of this gift. And really, this is the big idea. God uses suffering to draw us to himself more than anything else. Where did Paul go? He went to the Lord with his suffering. He didn't seek human wisdom. He didn't go to his buddies. He didn't turn to alcohol. He didn't even turn to religion. This is the special thing that happens in suffering. I hope that you can get this. Through his suffering, the Apostle Paul was immediately forced into the presence of God. And have you noticed that good times just don't do that? They just don't have the same power to do that. I mean, think about it. The more severe the trouble, isn't it true the more likely you are to have an increase in your prayer life? When they take your little baby into the hospital, you get real serious about your prayer life. When you find out your teenager's on drugs, you get real serious about your prayer life. When you find out that your spouse is really, really ill. When you find out that you're on the brink of losing your business and everything that you've put into it. When those things happen, your prayer life, my prayer life, takes a whole new level. God uses it to bring us unto himself. This is why the Apostle Paul would say this. He would say, therefore, based upon the fact, (laughs) based upon the fact that, first of all, my suffering has increased my faith faith and tested my character. That suffering has humbled me. That suffering has drawn me unto Jesus. Therefore, based upon that, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. So, for what reason? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am truly strong in Christ. What he's saying is that weaknesses, pain, suffering make me dependent upon the power of Christ. And they push me into the presence of Christ. That which makes me weak also makes me dependent. Did you ever ask for a gift, something maybe for your birthday or Christmas, and then got something else in its place that you didn't want? I bet that happens to kids all the time, (laughs) I think. Maybe they don't say anything. We had an experience with my oldest son, Ryan, when he was, I don't know, five or six years old. His grandfather would like to play a trick on him. And it began on his birthday. His birthday's in November. And Ryan's expecting a toy from his grandpa. And he would open this gift, and there would be a pair of socks. And I remember the first time this happening, Ryan looking at the socks, 
looking at us, looking back at the socks, just bewildered. And we've got all this on video. It's hilarious. And his grandfather is over in the corner crying his eyes out because he's laughing so hard. And we've tried to teach our kids to be thankful for whatever people give them, right, no matter what it is. And so Ryan ekes out a thank you, and he sets the socks down, and he goes on to open up his other presents. And then he did it again at Christmas, just, you know, a month later. And so Ryan's kind of getting conditioned a little bit. He's seeing the socks, and he's saying thank you real quickly. He's putting them down and going to the next one. He did it the next year also, and I think the last time he did it, he actually put some money inside of it, right? But by then, Ryan was so conditioned, you know, about the package that he didn't even think about what might be inside of it. I have a gift here. It's a pretty shoddy gift, isn't it? I mean, it's not very appealing. It's not really a gift that, you know, you would want to open. Maybe it's a little scary, right? It's kind of dark and depressing. It reminds me of the gifts that I received on my 50th birthday. You know, it's kind of that kind of thing. <laughs> But if we can get past the packaging, there might be something necessary, something beautiful, something really that we all want inside. Wrapped in the darkness is Christ himself. You say, well, what is the gift of suffering? What is it, really? Ultimately, folks, listen, ultimately, the gift of suffering, every gift of suffering, is Jesus. He is wanting you to turn to him through this. And this is wrapped in things that we would never want, never choose, never desire. We look at and say, that's not anything that I would even ever want nor accept. But if we're able to get past the outside to see what's contained within, we're going to see that all along, all along, the Father was trying to give us one thing. And that was Jesus. That's what he wanted all along. Now, I don't know where you are in this thing of suffering in your life. I don't know what you brought into the room with you. The truth is, there may be people even sitting next to you that don't know. There's private pain. Some private suffering. Something that you're walking through. And if you're a believer in Christ, I know what you have to wrestle with because I've wrestled with it too. Is where is this coming from and why is this here? But despite the source and despite the logic behind why it must be taking place, the thing that I've learned is that within every package of suffering, within every one of them, there is one thing that is constant. There's one thing that is true. And there's one thing that God wants more than anything else. And that is that he wants me to turn to him. And at some point I have to say, maybe God wants me to carry this. Maybe he's not wanting me to get rid of this. As much as I'm pleading to walk around it, God is saying, I need you to walk through this because I have some things beyond your sight to do in you and through you. And the point is not why is it here, nor what is the source. The point is, is Mike, this is a grand opportunity for you to deepen your love for me and for you to see a new side of me and for the rivers of faith to run deeper than you getting what you want every time you want it. There's something more I have for you. And that's something more is my relationship with you and your relationship with me. And God may be saying to you, like he said to me in the past, Mike, you're carrying this because you've got the shoulders to carry this. I need you to carry this burden. There's things that, that are going to take place that you don't know about, 
people that could be blessed through this, things that are going to take place in your life. You won't even know until heaven. But I need you to be willing to take this on as an assignment. Take this as a calling of obedience. Accept this from me. Or maybe you're in the room and the package, the suffering is your wake-up call. God has been trying to get your attention for years through pain. And you've seen this, you've experienced, you beat your head against this, but you've never opened it up to see what God was trying to do the whole time. He's trying to lead you to him because you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You're here today, you don't know him. And you need to know that God sent his son from heaven to this earth to be born through a virgin and to be a little boy and to grow up in the age of 30, he began his public ministry and he did amazing miracles to prove that he was the son of God. And one day he would lay down on a cross and he would die for your sins because he loves you. All that he did for you. And he would be buried in a tomb in the darkness. And he would be raised to life on Easter Sunday. And by coming to faith in him, we now receive from him a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ who lives within us forever and ever and ever, who brings purpose to our life and power to our life, and who ultimately one day will bring us to heaven when we die. Never, ever trusted Jesus as your Savior. This is your day. This is your day to do that. This is your day to unbox the gift and to find Christ right there in the middle of it. Every time suffering comes, right in the middle of it, He is there. Every time. Let's bow in prayer. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you to just consider God's word this morning. If you're here today, you do not know Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you've come to church before, even prayed a prayer or two, but you've never fallen to the feet of Christ to give him your life. To give him all that you are. He's been trying to get your attention, possibly even for years. And today is your day to unbox the gift. I would like to lead you in a prayer, a prayer that would allow you to turn in faith to Jesus to give him all that you are and to place your trust in him as Savior. So silently, just under your breath, just between you and God, I want to ask you to pray this prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for my sin. done so many things that are wrong. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please come into my life. I place my trust in who Jesus was. And I place my trust in who he is. Come into my life. Make me a new person. to live according to the purpose that you have for me for the rest of my life. And one day when I die, take me to heaven to be with you forever. Now the Bible says if you prayed that prayer, you've been born again, you're a Christian. You've begun a personal relationship with Jesus and it makes all the difference in the world. It's going to change your life. It's going to redirect your future. And I just encourage you to grow in that 
relationship. Let someone know that would be happy to hear this news. Let someone know about what you did. Let us know so that we can pray for you and encourage you in your newfound faith. For all the rest of us, maybe you've been a believer in Jesus for years. And God's been trying to get your attention too. More than anything, it has to do with the relationship that you have with Him. He wants you to turn to Him. He wants you to grow deeper. He wants you to trust Him in greater ways. He wants you to give Him more areas of your life. And I would encourage you to turn to Him in faith, to fall at His feet, and to see Him right there in the middle of your suffering. So, Father, thank you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you so much for the story of this amazing man, the Apostle Paul, um, who 2,000 years ago had these experiences. And you led him to record them for us and to share his heart. And we are changed by them, God. So help us to walk from this place being different people, finding you in the middle of our shattered dreams and finding that you are sufficient, that you are enough. We pray these things in Jesus' name for his sake.